This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. We talk about inspiration a lot here on Revision Path. So I wanted to ask Steven Song, a product designer at Facebook, what inspires him? Yeah, um, I feel like a lot of museums and installations and art galleries inspire me. Um, I spend a lot of my time in front of the computer and thinking about like, you know, product design as it comes to like digital products. But it's always interesting for me to kind of walk through a space and think about like how architects, how industrial designers, interior designers, you know, shape spaces that we move through. And it's kind of an, always an interesting reminder for me to you know, remember that, you know, there's the outside world, that we're all humans and that, you know, even the spaces we move through can be designed in the same way we sit in front of a computer and design something for the screen. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. This week, Project 202 is looking for a senior experience researcher in Seattle, Washington. We also have job listings from indeed.com, so head to the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to apply and to search for any other listings. Don't forget to sign up for weekly job alerts so when there are new positions added to the job board, you'll get an email so you can be the first to apply. Again, that's revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, I wanted to talk about our sponsors, Glitch, Google Design, and MailChimp. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. Whether it's beautiful digital art, handy tools to help you do your work, or a site for your project or cause, you'll find things on Glitch that reminds us the web can still be a fun, creative place full of unexpected surprises. Get started today at Glitch.com. Google Design is a cooperative effort led by designers, writers, and developers at Google. They work across teams to publish original content, produce great events, and foster creative and educational partnerships that advance design and technology. For more information on news, design resources, and their design podcasts, check them out at design.google. MailChimp is the world's leading marketing platform for small businesses. Millions of people and businesses around the world trust MailChimp to publish the right content to the right person at the right place at the right time. Build your brand, sell more stuff, find your people, and tell the world your story. Sign up for a free account today and give it a try. MailChimp. Send better email. We've got two new reviews this week. Uh, the first one comes from Stitcher. Uh, we we haven't had a Stitcher review in like four years or so, but thank you for the review. Uh, this is from Steph Stew, and it's called Required Listening for Design Students. Here it is. I loved my early design classes, but was so dissatisfied with the lack of black representation in what we were learning. I wondered if there were black designers in the history of design. I stumbled across the Revision Path podcast in my online search, and it takes on the past, present, and future of design through a lens that I have never seen. I have learned so much and found other resources through this podcast that have impacted the trajectory of my studies and career in design. If you are a black student or any student studying any field within tech or design, this is a must listen. Wow. Thank you so much, Steph Stu, for that, uh, that review. Actually, I think... Uh, this is one of our patrons, so if that's the case, then thank you even more. I'm so glad you were able to find the show and that it's really helped you out in that way. The fact that it's changed the trajectory of your studies and your career, that's, wow. <laughs> that's that's mind-blowing. That's great to know. Uh, the second review comes from Apple Podcasts. Uh, this comes from Wonderlove, and it's titled Great Show. Discovered via interview with Michael Hollander. Insightful questions and guests. So short to the point, uh, but thank you, Wonderlove, so much for that review. It's always great to hear reviews from listeners. So please, if you're listening and you want to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, please do keep them coming. 
Now, if you're listening to this episode and you want to hear next week's episode a little early, uh, we actually put out an ad-free version now of the episodes. Uh, you should become our patron over at Patreon. Now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives in our field are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support our mission, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. For just $5 a month, you can get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash revision path. Now for this week's interview. Like I mentioned before, for the month of August, we're focusing on Atlanta's vibrant art scene. And this week's guest is artist and scholar Fahamu Peku. Let's start the show. All right. So tell us who you are and what you do. Great. My name is Fahamu Peku. I am a visual artist and scholar. And yeah, I make work about the black experience, particularly the black male experience in an attempt to redirect our understanding of black male masculinity. The goal being to challenge and to intervene in the visual culture and the visual narrative around black male masculinity and to present black men in the more complex, compelling human side of that experience. Nice. That sounds like a lot to to try to accomplish with your work, but I know I know that you've been very successful with it. So, first, want to congratulate you on your recent PhD. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, so, so, Doctor, I Peku. guess I should really be introducing myself as Doctor for how many Yeah. <laughs> so, what made you decide to go down that route to getting a PhD? You know, I've always incorporated a great deal of reading and research into my art projects, even before thinking about them as scholarly works or as a form of scholarship. So very early on, especially when I began my Neopop series, which for those who are familiar with my work, are the paintings on the covers of various art magazines with, you know, this character that I created, Fahamu Peku was the shit, and this really like hyper- machismo, super bravado, like hip hop, bad boy kind of thing on the covers of art magazines. And when I first began doing that, oftentimes friends who would see me working on different projects or, you know, different, um, you know, colleagues of mine would comment, you know, on the paintings and suggest things that I should be reading or other artists I should be looking at or other philosophers I should be looking at who had projects that were in the same general concept as the paintings I was working on. And I really found that fascinating. So I really kind of began going down a rabbit hole of this kind of uh, research based art. But, you know, as my career began to take off, you know, I would be invited to various universities and colleges as a guest lecturer or to do studio visits and MFA programs and stuff. And, you know, at the time, I only had my bachelor's. And when I would be at these institutions, you know, I often would begin asking questions about the admission process, you know, for these institutions. And, you know, they would always look at me like I had another head growing out of my neck. You know, they would be like, you know, why do you want to get an MFA? You're already doing everything people go through MFA programs are looking to do when they get out. Like you're already doing it. There's really nothing that our program can really teach you that you haven't already done. And because of my thirst for knowledge and my passion for learning and stuff like that, that was a bit frustrating to Mm -hmm. find that, you know, I was in this like sort of limbo space where MFA wasn't really going to be a feasible option for me. And then one day I was reading something about uh, a program in Australia. It was called Studio is Research and it was a PhD program. And at the time, I never really thought about a PhD because, you know, for in the fine arts, an MFA is a terminal degree. And so, you know, when I saw this program, I began thinking about, oh, maybe a Ph.D. is an option. And maybe sometime shortly after that, I, a friend of mine who was in a Ph.D. program at University of Texas in art history was visiting Atlanta. And she invited me to a conference she was going to in Savannah around contemporary African art. And I attended the conference and that had an opportunity to meet a lot of, you know, Ph.D. students and, you know, scholars who were working around African diasporic art. And it was just really fascinating. And I knew at that point, you know, I would like to try to get a Ph.D., but I didn't really know where to go. And I didn't want to get into a program that would take me away from my studio practice, you know. But long story short, I met a professor from 
from Emory, who was a regular at my karaoke event that I used to do. And he began telling me about this program at Emory called the Institute of Liberal Arts. And he suggested that I take a look at them. And I did. And, I, you know, it was a perfect program. It was the perfect fit for me. It was a interdisciplinary uh, humanities program that's really designed for people who have academic or scholarly pursuits that don't fit into traditional academic boxes. So you're allowed to kind of dip and dab into a lot of different fields of study to put together a, a, your research project. Interesting. So I guess in that in that whole program, like what kind of things were you doing? Were you, I guess, doing lectures or, or what? can you sort of like tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So the program actually ended up being really great and it opened me up to a lot of ways of thinking and producing that ultimately have, have, have been, become a great benefit to my studio practice. It's a traditional program in the sense that, you know, you have two years of coursework where you take in various classes, philosophy classes, different project-based courses and stuff like that, and going through a traditional graduate program. But when I began the program, I was advised by my student advisor to pick courses that would complement my studio practice as opposed to things that would kind of detract, distract me from that. And that mm-hmm. ended up being great advice because ultimately what I was able to do, like, you know, I started a program in 2012. So every exhibition that I've had since 2012 has come out of coursework that I did while a student at Emory. So, you know, for example, um, one of the exhibitions I did in 2013, it's called All That Glitters Ain't Goals, was was one of those projects. Um, another course that I took on experiments in scholarly form, which really encouraged thinking outside of the box in terms of the presentation of scholarship. And I, for that class, you know, our final project, we had to come up with a proposal for something that we would do that is an engagement with the academic idea, but that is not a traditional academic form. And I did a proposal to guest edit an issue of an art publication or journal around the intersections of art and hip hop and ultimately presented that proposal to Art Papers magazine. And they loved the idea and they they gave me the the reins and I was able to guest edit an issue of Art Papers on the intersections of fine art and hip hop in 2014, which fell right in line with the whole Jay-Z video Picasso Baby that he shot in Pace Gallery. So everything, it was like very timely how these projects came to be. So, you know, pretty much everything that I did that that came out of coursework has made its way into my, my creative practice. And so as a result, you know, it just really became like an added bonus as opposed to like a split focus. No, that's amazing. That, you know, the fact that your coursework and your studio work were able to kind of mesh together in that way and that they allowed you to choose that. I mean, for the show, I talked to a lot of students and design educators, et cetera. And one thing that I tend to hear a lot from both of them is they don't really get the chance to learn about or or really even to teach anything that has to do with any kind of, I guess, other cultural type of, I guess, contribution to design and to art and et cetera. Essentially, they're not learning about the designs or the work of people that look like them. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting to kind of hear, you know, that you went this route with getting a PhD and that you really were able to kind of tailor it to stuff that you were already doing instead of having to fit what you were doing into like this PhD shaped box. Right. Exactly. That, you know, the school might've already put together. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a really great benefit. And, you know, I should also point out that, you know, it also gave me, the benefit of developing a new medium through which I can also work, which is academic writing, which also became a really great asset to me in terms of my studio production as well. I think early on, you know, I had so many ideas and I was, you know, like I said, doing so much research and reading and stuff. And I was trying to squeeze all of these ideas into my paintings and they were super dense with ideas and themes and messages and stuff. But learning to do academic writing or critical writing became a great way for me to address a lot of the ideas that were in my head such that I could pull out a specific focus or a specific theme and make that the the basis of a series of paintings and then, you know, contribute to that with an essay or, or a think piece that I can unpack a lot more ideas 
and the paintings can be paintings, the writings can be writings, you know, it, it really worked out in my favor in that way so that I, I'm, you know, I'm not like forcing, you know, square pegs into round holes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I tell designers, you know, how important it is to kind of have that writing skill when it comes to your work. I think, you know, focusing on the visuals is sort of one thing, but if you're really able to then turn around and explain it mm -hmm. or to break down concepts and stuff like that, it just really, I think, helps you become a more well-rounded designer because then you're looking at things and analyzing design and art, you know, really in a different way than just looking at it from, you know, a visual sense. That's correct. Yeah. So it sounds like your creative process, you know, kind of changed a bit from going through this whole PhD track and getting the degree. I would say, I wouldn't say necessarily changed as much as it evolved. Okay. okay. You know, because I, I mean, I still have a very similar process in terms of the way that I work. You know, when I have a concept, especially for a, a painting series, you know, it always starts the same way with a photo shoot. So I collaborate with photographers to basically shoot me for for source material for the series of paintings. And then, you know, I, I go through like a designer or art director selecting images that will best translate into the idea for the painting. So there's that editing process. And then I actually begin the process of painting, which is another editing process. But like I said, um, the addition of the uh, critical writing now comes to play, you know, gives me another outlet to unpack some of the ideas that I'm addressing and also learn the benefit of of interdisciplinary work so that, you know, if I have an idea, I don't have to try to make every idea into a painting. Mm -hmm. Some ideas work best as an essay. Some ideas work best as a video. Some ideas work best as a performance piece or as a drawing or as a painting. And, um, you know, when you look at my, my dissertation, it's really an expression of of all of that. You know, my dissertation has five different mediums of work all combining to to form the, 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 the dissertation, each medium, each body of work itself being a chapter. So with the dissertation, you did you did you end up doing like a, a show for that as well to exhibit it? Yeah. So the dissertation is actually the first of its kind. It's a visual dissertation. And so it's a traveling exhibition of original work that that all comes out of my my Ph.D. research. So in addition to the essay, there is about a hundred and seventy page written document that goes and explains the, the impetus for the visual works as well as breakdown of my ideas and research. Wow, that, that is impressive. Congratulations to you again, man. That is really something. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So now that you've, you know, gotten the PhD, what is the next step for you? Like what's what's some of the type of work that you're doing now? So I'm still continuing to build on the ideas that I began to uncover through my research and the dissertation and, you know, my work. Currently, I'm actually about to begin a new project. One of the major themes that came out of the, the dissertation is this African philosophy around the concept of what's called remembering, R-E hyphen membering or the reconstitution of the black collective body and not the physical body, no, or not specifically only the physical body, but the black conscious body, the black spiritual body, the black mental body, you know, so really trying to reframe our, the ways in which we see ourselves moving in the world by returning to indigenous concepts, ideas, themes, rituals, practices that help to shape and form our identity before the intervention of European ideas and colonialism. So so those are kind of the themes that I'm working with right now in the work. I, I, I have to bring up, I guess, this uh, this comparison of Wakanda when you mentioned that. And I and I hate to say like it's it's kind of a one to one thing, but I feel like something that I've seen since Black Panther is that now when there are kind of black artistic things coming out, they always tend to get that description like, oh, this is like something from Black Panther, or something <laughs> from Wakanda, you know, like it, it almost feels like it sort of lessens the importance in a way by doing that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a testament of our collective understanding of things like we, we typically go as an American society, I should say, broadly, we typically go for like low hanging fruit, like, you know, mm -hmm. We want the, the media buzzword. We want something that's e like people can easily like 
sink their teeth into, which becomes problematic in a lot of ways because then you lose the critical engagement. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about. It makes it appear somewhat superficial, but it's really fascinating, though, when you do think about Black Panther and even some of the themes and ideas that were brought up in that film, it's actually a lot more complex and, 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 and critically engaged than, than people typically give it credit for for being. Especially, yeah. you know, some of the ideas around like ancestry and, you know, the importance of ancestral legacy, the importance of language. That's, you know, like the fact that they chose to speak an indigenous African language in Wakanda. Like all of those things are really powerful, powerful ideas that we hadn't really seen before in in cinema, particularly in an in a American story. And even though it's based in a fictional African nation, it is still a very much American enterprise, you know, this idea of the Black Panther. Yeah. I just think it's really fascinating that it took a film uh, with that type of commercial presence to get people even superficially thinking about <laughs> leg- you know, African legacy and African ancestry in that kind of way. That's true. That's true. That actually brings me to a question that comes from uh, from one of our listeners who actually has been on the show. Her name is uh, Regine Gilbert. And so she asks, with the folding of Interview Magazine, Interview is this uh, magazine, I think it was founded by Andy Warhol yeah. decades and decades ago. Mm-hmm. So she asks, with the folding of Interview Magazine, do you feel that there's an opportunity to showcase pop culture in a way that is reflective of the 21st century with the changes in technology and behaviors. I think that kind of speaks a little bit to what you were just saying though. Uh, Yeah, I would, I would certainly say that that opportunity exists and not only does it exist, but it also creates a great, uh, creates a space for us to, to really begin to think through what that might look like. I think as we, see a lot of publications that have had a major like popular culture presence fold we really have to start thinking about media in a new way Mm -hmm. you know technology has really changed the way that we interact with the world people don't pick up magazines anymore people barely pick up albums anymore at one point digital readers were threatening physical books (laughs) there's many I, i think it opens up the space for many opportunities for conversations to happen about how I see our engagement with these forms or with the necessity of these kinds of vessels for information. What that could ultimately be, I'm not sure, but I do think those opportunities certainly exist. So let's kind of switch gears here a little bit. Uh, Before we started recording, you mentioned that you're originally from New Jersey. Is that right? Uh, New York, from Brooklyn. New York. Sorry, from New York. Tell me what it was like growing up there and eventually what uh, brought you here to Atlanta. Yeah. So I was born in Brooklyn and I lived there till I was about six years old. And then I ended up moving south to South Carolina after I lost my parents and I was adopted and grew up in South Carolina. So I can speak more to that experience than I can to New York because, you know, I was very young when I left. Okay. But South Carolina was a really interesting experience for me for a number of reasons, certainly was very much informed by the trauma of losing my parents. But then also it was a a very distinct cultural shift. You know, I was in a very small town in South Carolina and grew up in a very poor projects, you know, with an apartment with several cousins. Like, you know, I, I was telling my children this recently, like I didn't have my own bed until I left to go to college. So, For me, art was something that I discovered a passion for around that time, around the time of about six years old. And, you know, recognized that it was something that I was good at. It was something that people responded to positively that I did. And I set myself to do that. Like for my entire childhood, all I did was literally sit in a corner and draw. By the time I was in middle school, I made my own comic books that I would like sneak into the library early in the morning in Xerox and then sell them to my friends for like 50 cents, you know, they have money (laughs) for lunch. And yeah, that that was my experience. I I didn't have the, have an opportunity or the privilege of being able to engage in what was called the fine arts, you know, like painting and sculptures. Like I never, there were no museums or galleries or nothing like that in the town that I lived in. So my 
frame of reference for art was was simply cartoons. And so I from the time I was about nine years old, I decided that I was going to be a cartoon animator. And my goal was I was going to be the black Walt Disney. So from the time I was nine, like I said, till I got to college, all I did was do cartoons all day, day in, day out. And, you know, I ended up coming to Atlanta to attend the Atlanta College of Art on a scholarship and I majored in animation. And yeah, so that's what brought me here. I arrived in Atlanta in summer of 1993 with $40 in my pocket and a box that had the few clothes that I owned and a couple art supplies. That was it. Wow. Yeah. Tell me what Atlanta was like back then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, it was, you know, it was amazing. I hadn't, you know what I mean? Like, I, like again, I left New York so early that I didn't really have a, a recollection of it. And growing up in that small town where, like, I think there were like four traffic lights in the whole town. Atlanta was like, I might as well have been in New York City when I arrived here. You know, I remember looking at like the Bank of America building, like, you know, was an alien, like, wow. <laughs> and, you know, my first few years here was really interesting because it was a very, uh, it was a very insulated experience. I attended the Atlanta College of Art, which is, which was on the campus of the Woodruff Art Center. So where new addition to the High Museum now sits was turn of the century apartment building that served as our dormitory. And the Woodruff Art Center building where the Alliance Theater and the symphony orchestra are the third and fourth floors of that building was our campus and so my perspective of atlanta existed between the art center marta station the Lindbergh marta station lennox marta station and by my junior year in college west end marta station <laughs> uh, that was atlanta to me you know uh, yeah you know you know we uh went to um from our campus at the art center, we would take the train one stop north to Lindbergh, you know, to go to the grocery store over there or to go to binders and buy art supplies. On Saturdays, we would go up to Lenox to, you know, try to get phone numbers from girls or <laughs> for jobs. And yeah, like by my junior year in college, I started taking classes at Spelman taking painting classes, actually, at Spelman College. And so that introduced me to the West End, which was a huge culture shock for me because uh, I had never been any place with where I was surrounded by that many black people. And also to see, you know, so much black culture, you know, like at that time in the West End, you know, there were several black bookstores and you can, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the Underground was another spot that we would frequent. But even at the underground, they had stores like, I forget this, the, what it was called. It was a store that sold a bunch of African art. Oh, man, what was the name of the store? It was at the underground? At the underground, yeah. I know the store you're talking about. I don't remember the name, but I've been to that store. Yeah. I know the one you're talking used about. To, though. I used to live in there <laughs> uh, drawing African masks. You know, and, and the thing about it that was really fascinating was that, you know, I, I learned from talking to my uncle. Mind you, um, you know, like I said, I, I lost my parents at an early age, so... When I got to South Carolina, I was adopted by, you know, some relatives of my mother, but nobody ever talked about my parents. So I didn't know very much about them until I got to Atlanta and I had an uncle who lived here. It's my mother's older brother um, and they were really close. He would tell me all these stories about my mom and dad and about their interaction in like the Pan-Africanist movement. And, you know, in his house, he had a lot of like African art and, you know, I was just like really blown away by all these stories that they told me, and, you know, and at this time I was also, do, you know, very much being um, introduced to concepts of like black ideology and reading Ivan Van Sertema and Francis Craig mm -hmm. Welsing and, you know, stuff like that. Like, yeah. So I was like, you know, I, I thought I was a radical. <laughs> and then to learn, you know, that there was this connection, you know, between those ideas and those teachings and, things that my parents did, you know, just really like fueled me on even more. And so all of those things really began to shape my perspective of Atlanta. It's still, for as much as it was a big city, definitely comparatively speaking to where I'd grown up, it still felt very much like a small town mm -hmm. because I did not move around 
in the city. I didn't have access to a car or anything like that. So, you know, and as you know, Atlanta is a city where you really need a car to kind of get the full breadth of it, especially back in the early 90s like that. So, you know, fast forward to um, 97, you know, the year that I graduated college. By this point, I was living on the corner of Peachtree and 3rd in a building. The address was 710 Peachtree. Oh, I remember 710 Peachtree. It was called the Scandinavian House back when I lived there. Like young black people living there, you know, people had just graduated college, got their first job and first apartment. You know what I mean? And I remember one day talking to a friend of mine who was a, a couple years older than me. Her sister and I went to school together. My friend Melissa was telling me about this club. She was like, I think you'll really like it. It's really cool and RC like you. You should go check it out. It's really close to where you live. Oh, I know the club you're talking about. <laughs> and so one Wednesday, she invited me to go down and, you know, I came out of my building, hooked the right on third and walked down to the end of the block. And there was Yin Yang Cafe. And she was right. She, you know, it was never a more appropriate space for me than Yin Yang. And I ended up making some of the most endearing and enduring friendships in that space and met a world of amazing young black artists across genres, you know, musicians, singers, performers, poets, dancers, painters, you name it. Like all of us hung out in that little hole in the wall and it completely, completely transformed my idea of Atlanta and transformed my idea of myself. I remember thinking like this must be what the Harlem Renaissance felt like. After, like I said, I graduated in 97 and then around 1998, I decided that I was going to moved to New York because, of course, if you want to be an artist, you got to live in New York, you know. Mm -hmm. So I decided to move back to New York and try to get on in the art world in New York. And I had a big send off at Yin Yang. You know, everybody came through to send me off and wish me well on my way and got to New York and lived there for about two years. And that entire time, I just kept looking for a place like Yin Yang and I couldn't find it. So I ended up deciding to come back to Atlanta. I was like, I want to be in Atlanta. I want to be around Yin Yang, whatever is about to happen there is going to blow very soon. And it's going to be the people who are my friends at Yin Yang that are going to be the ones lighting the fuse. And I want to be mm-hmm. in that number. You know what I mean? I want to be a part of that. So that's what brought me back here. Wow. Yeah. That's a story. I, as you were saying that, it actually reminded me when I, I first got here to Atlanta in uh, 99. So like, right, not too long after the Olympics and stuff. And I'd say probably my first four or five years in Atlanta were kind of similar to that. Like I live, I went to Morehouse. So I was here in the West end mm-hmm. uh, where I currently live now. So definitely in this area, but I used to work at the Woodruff Art Center back when the Atlanta college of art was still there. I used to sell tickets at the box office. Oh. I remember going up to the fourth floor and getting lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <coming back to, laughs> um, and I used to live a little bit further up in Buckhead, like near peach tree and, Right where that Barnes and Noble is on Peachtree up in Buckhead, right near the Moe's. I used to live up there. Mm-hmm. I also stayed in, a, in an apartment complex similar to 710 Peachtree. I stayed in the Darlington. I was just going to say the Darlington. Um, I knew exactly what you was talking about. Yeah, <laughs> I stayed there like two years when I was in college before it before it is what it is now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I used to stay there yeah. uh, when it was nice and quiet and uh, not what it is now. I'll just say that. <laughs> Scandinavian house and the Darlington were like the two towers. <laughs> yeah, and, and I remember... Them being the places that people wanted to stay yeah. because all your utilities were included right. in the rent. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd, you'd pay your rent and everything was taken care of. You know, you just had to pay for like a phone or Internet or something. Or, seeing as how you've been here in Atlanta, you know, for a very long time, I'm sure you've seen how the city has changed, not just in terms of buildings and government and all that kind of stuff, but probably you've seen how the art community has changed here as well. Oh, yeah. You mentioned Yin Yang Cafe and everything. Tell me how you have seen things change since then. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating. You know, like I said, when I finished college, most of the people that I graduated with were looking for the first thing smoking out of here. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because, you know, Atlanta was was cool. It's a great place, but it wasn't the place to be if you wanted to be professional practicing artist. You wanted to be in New York or Chicago or L.A. or someplace like that, you know, so everybody was leaving, you know, if they weren't going to graduate school, they were moving to one of those cities to chase dreams, you know, which was really fascinating. 
especially when I found that little pocket, that world at Yin Yang, which again was like an incubator. Like I, I consider Yin Yang kind of like the graduate school that I went to. Mm-hmm. And even when Yin Yang closed around like 2000, 2001 or so, again, all of the people who were kind of like the stars began to, to break out and go to other cities. And I think you really, really started to see a big change in the city in terms of the arts community. There were a couple moments that I can kind of pinpoint. So I think in the early 2000s, around like 2003, 2004, there was a big, big boom in terms of art galleries, mm-hmm. particularly in Castleberry Hill. I started a graphic design business when I moved here, when I moved back here from New York. And so I got my second office space in Castleberry Hill in 2002. And when I moved there, there was not really very much over there. But within about a year, there was like 14 or 15 art galleries in a one mile radius in Castleberry. Mm -hmm. It was jumping, you know, it was really exciting. Every month they would have these like huge art crawls and people would come from all over the city and the streets would be packed. People would just go gallery to gallery, drinking wine and meeting up with friends. And it, I mean, it was so cool. It was a lot of fun. But then one by one, as that area become more popular and, and, and ultimately gentrified, a lot of those spaces began to shut down. And this was like right around the time that the economy also began to tank. And that really kind of brought the the art community to a screeching halt, I think, for a little while. Mm -hmm. But then very shortly after, it kind of went in a slightly different direction because as the the country was in a kind of economic crisis, a lot of those people who I'd known from college and who had moved away right after began coming back to Atlanta because it was still relatively inexpensive to live here. And with them, they brought all of these ideas and projects and programs and opportunities that didn't exist here before. And and the arts community became a very artist driven economy in the sense that, you know, it wasn't institutions that were keeping the arts community going. It was the artists themselves creating opportunities. You had people come through like, you know, Courtney Hammond, who created like Dashboard and the guys who came up with Wonder Root and Burn Away and, you know, like all these different like arts organizations that begin to crop up out of the aftermath of the economic crash, which also began to make Atlanta a very desirable place for artists to be as more and more opportunities begin to emerge again as the, the economic viability of being an artist and live, you know, having a, a quality of life while also still very much more, was still very much more attractive than, say, New York and Chicago, where, you know, you might have a 400 square foot apartment for the price somebody's paying for a 2,500 square foot house. Those things really kind of changed, you know, the, the, the city in a lot of ways. But I think the, another thing that really happened that created a big change, too, was the institutional support for artists began to shift, you know, so when the galleries disappeared, the institutions kind of became the gatekeepers. I remember there was a time where the high museum wasn't necessarily a place where you would find local artists engaging in any kind of way. And now everybody's at the high and the high is doing like all these like really great uh, programs and initiatives to like really engage the community beyond the, the very small Buckhead window that it once operated in. And so it's, it's, it's become a very different place, which is really awesome. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely appreciative of how it has shifted. And I'm also excited about the fact that so many great artists have returned here, but then also, you know, a number of great artists have who are, you know, continue to graduate from places like uh, Georgia State and SCAD like that are deciding to stay here and plant flags. And so it's it's really starting to shift the dynamic of what it means to be an artist here. Do you think that now, because of these changes, Atlanta has a a good reputation as a city for the arts? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think it's one that is, is constantly growing and evolving. Again, I think a lot of recent developments in terms of civic growth are changing the perception that people outside of Atlanta have about Atlanta and its cultural and arts communities. I think it was last year, 
the city announced a major investment in the acquisition of public art pieces. You know, there is a great deal of energy around public art in the city. And, you know, right now it's still very limited. I think a lot of people are just thinking murals. You know, let's put murals over here. Let's put murals over here. But, you know, a number of ways to engage in the arts. It's still very early. But I think these conversations are evolving. There, you know, now I'll give an example. You know, at one point, Art Papers was known for its annual art auction. It was a great fundraiser for the publication, and the artists here were would be eager to contribute work to the auction because it introduced you to a new crop of collectors. It was a great way, you know, great socializing event, et cetera, et cetera. But the success of that auction program prompted other organizations to mirror it. At one point, just the art papers auction. Within a few years, there were maybe like eight or nine organizations doing art auctions every year, you know, and they all wanted the same artists to contribute. And that became problematic, you know, like, okay, look, I I can donate a piece to this auction, but I can't do eight art auctions in a year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so now you see a lot of these organizations starting to do, to create innovative fundraising experiences, you know, maybe instead of an auction, it's a, a party, like a, you know, like an art party, or maybe it's a, a monster drawing rally, you know, at the High Museum. You know what I mean? Like there are these, you know, all really, really cool and innovative ideas for organizations to, to kind of engage the arts community and to raise money. Given that as a, an example to so talk about the murals. So, you know, I think with the success uh, like that with the success that Living Walls initially had with their mural program, it sparked a lot of other developers and organizations to try to do something similar. Let's do some murals. And now everybody's mm-hmm. trying to do murals, but I think that's going to tank. And people are going to have to figure out new ways of engaging this concept of public art beyond murals. Like there's more to it than murals. There's more to public art engagement than murals. And I think we'll, we'll see in very short time that conversation shifting, you know, around what public art can be, should be, and how it can be done. Uh, there's a guy I know, um, I think he's based out of North Carolina now, but his name is Jake Levitas. Mm-hmm. And he heads up this organization called Our City. And what they do, you know, kind of like how you're saying with public art, they make and commission public art pieces at different, you know, cities around the country. But the art pieces, they try to make sure that they are, you know, like central to the community. So like, for example, nobody's going to come into the West end and just put up like a big spoon or something, you know, they're going to, they would come and put up or create or work with local artists to create some kind of public art piece, not necessarily a mural. It's mostly sculpture, like sculptural types of things that they make. And they'll include that in the neighborhood to be something that is representative of the city and of the people that live there in these kind of particular places. So I feel like, you know, with Atlanta, certainly, yeah, we are seeing a lot of murals. I mean, I, I live right in the corner of of, uh, of Lee Street and Abernathy, and <laughs> there's lots of murals over here in the West End. <laughs> I mean, there's there's no shortage of going to different buildings and seeing stuff painted. I think even as you just go, like in downtown, et cetera, there's lots of murals everywhere, um, which is great. I, I see what you're saying about like how that could end up sort of dying out, because when you have things like Living Walls or like Forward Warrior, for example— mm-hmm. You know, these murals only stay up for certain amounts of time. You know, it's kind of just a canvas that keeps changing. So it's not something that really even becomes that permanent to the city. Mm -hmm. It's only up there until someone paints over. Like if someone does a mural on the side of a building, if a developer buys the building and paints over that, then it's gone. Right. Like, where does it go then? Well, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, we definitely have to really begin thinking about other ways of engaging around public art and thinking about what public art can be because there's so many opportunities and ways to engage and every visual artist is not a muralist. Like that's a very specialized skill. Everybody can't do that Mm -hmm. well. And so even if it's a permanent mural, you know, you need a person who can think through, like think through the project so that it has uh, longevity, that it has relevance, that it's engaging, you know, like there's, there's lots of things to consider and you can't just get anybody to throw up a mural just because the people in the neighborhood, in the adjacent neighborhood got a mural. <laughs> you can't, yeah. you know what I mean? So, 
But all, all that to say, I mean, I think the city is really transforming around the arts and, and, and it is still very much an artist driven conversation, which is a really beautiful thing because it's not a conventional way that arts economies are driven. They're typically institutionally driven, like top down, money down. But this is more so, you know, the artists finding and creating opportunities where none exist. And, mm. you know, and, that, and that's, that makes Atlanta a very unique and special place. Now, you've had the opportunity to exhibit your work pretty much all over the world. I know uh, last year, for example, you were part of a retrospective exhibition at Society Generale. It's called uh, Mirrors of the Man, yeah. Miroirs de l'Homme. Yes. I've completely butchered that in French, so I apologize about that. And I speak French. So I should know that better. Anyway, <laughs> tell me about that experience. What was your time like there in Paris and, and how did they kind of receive your work? Yeah, man. This was my fourth exhibition in Paris uh, wow. since 2010. And so I've, you know, I've been showing there quite frequently for the last eight years. And, you know, I have a really great group of collectors and supporters in France and surrounding countries. Some of those collectors actually got together and presented to my gallery this idea of doing a retrospective of, of my work. They were able to collaborate with Société Générale. And, you know, I was the first artist to have a solo exhibition at Société Générale. And, uh, you know, because they typically just show their collection. But this time it was the first, you know, opportunity that they had ever taken the work of one artist and put together an exhibition. So it was really, really amazing. It was over 45 works from European collections alone. And for me, it was a bit surreal to see over almost two decades of my work in one place. Wow. One time. It's still very difficult to describe that feeling, but it was it was a really amazing experience. And I, I you know, like I said, I, I, I get big love in Paris and big love from me. So. Where do you feel like your work has gotten the best reception? I think I get a lot of love here at home as well, but I certainly get a lot of love over in Europe. And, and I think the res the reactions and responses are, are actually different. And I think, you know, that might be based on cultural differences. I think there is a, a depth of reading that happens amongst my European followers that is a bit different from the responses that I have here in the, in the U.S., which, you know, is actually maybe prompted a bit more by the nature of the contemporary themes and presence in the work, which tends to catch the eye of, you know, my collectors here in the States. They're a bit more engaged with the sort of like the cultural commentary, mm -hmm. the work, where in Paris they are... They seem a bit more engaged in the work in terms of that's really tricky kind of question to answer. And, and I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. I, I, I can see the difference and sense the difference, but I can't necessarily put it into words. But, yeah, I don't I don't know that it's one over the other. I think that there's you know certainly a, a distinction in what appeals to, you know, the European collectors versus the American collectors. But across the board, I think the support is genuine. That actually brings me to a question that uh, Goldie Gold asked. You, you know Goldie. Yeah. You've just had Goldie on the show recently. Goldie. <laughs> and he wanted to know, uh, do people recognize the religious iconography present in your work? Some do. My work incorporates a lot of themes and concepts from African spirituality and particularly of Ifa, sometimes known as Yoruba. For people who are familiar with those practices, they certainly identify the, the themes and narratives right away. But for people who aren't as familiar, it certainly piques their interest. And I get a lot of questions about it, you know, about mm -hmm. the symbolism, about the these themes and ideas. And it prompts people to begin to do their own research into it, which is also great. In a lot of ways, the, the work becomes a conversation starter for people who are both familiar as well as unfamiliar with those themes. I would be completely misrepresenting myself and my work if I were to pretend like I'm the first person to do it. But I think that, you know, a number of other artists have dealt with it in, in other ways. Mine has over time become a lot more overt even though, you know, a lot of these things and ideas were always in the work, but more subtly so. Now it's 
been, become a bit more overt. And I think in, in that overtness, people are really starting to recognize it. And, and you know, like I said, it, it sparks a lot of intrigue and, and questions and interest. Now, you've won numerous awards and fellowships and everything for your work. On a personal level, how have those awards and fellowships changed for you as your profile has risen? Like, do you feel like there's been a change in how your work is received now because of that? How? No. But I would say it certainly has opened my work up to more people. You know, sometimes something like a a recognition or an award puts you in front of audiences that may or may not have been familiar with you to begin with. You know, so people like, for example, somebody who is familiar with the Joan Mitchell Foundation, you know, sees my name come across and they're like, oh, I've never heard of this artist before. Let me take a look at him. You know what I mean? So people who are might, might be led to me through those awards. But I don't think it necessarily has changed the way, changed the reception of the work. For me, it, you know, just creates, you know, more challenges for me to try to continue to build and to maintain the, excuse me, engagement. And to, you know, elevate the work, you know, so I never look at these things as like terminal, like, oh, man, I got this award. I'm good now. It's like, okay, yeah, you know, what's the next thing to chase? You know what I mean? So I'm always trying Mm -hmm. to outdo myself. So, you know, I'm certainly grateful for all of the awards and recognition and stuff like that. But, you know, today, though, the work is really about really about the audience and trying to have a meaningful engagement with the audience and not necessarily with the awards. Yeah. Speaking of the audience, I, I have a this is a interesting question. So I've been rereading uh, Citizen by Claudia Rankin. Yeah. And there's a part in the book where she talks about this video. It's like this old time, old time. It's like seven or eight years old. This old YouTube video from Hennessy Youngman. You might know what I'm talking about here. It's this video called How to Be a Successful Black Artist. Yeah. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I'm, I know it. <laughs> so you might know where I'm going here. So, you know, before he did that video, he had one that was just called how to be a successful artist. And so he starts giving this advice about, you know, how you can be a successful artist. And then he's like, you know, this might not work for blacks because if a nigga paints a flower, <laughs> it becomes a slavery flower. Right. So it was like basically saying that like the relationship sometimes between the viewer, maybe the white viewer, maybe someone else, but the relationship between the viewer and the black artist become skewed in a way. Mm-hmm. Have you found that kind of interpretation in your art? Like have people approached you in that way because of, of uh, the subject and the, the themes that you are putting forth in your work? Yeah, I have. And I, I want to share a story with you just last week, you know, I started playing around with this new feature on Instagram that allows people to ask you questions. And, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> one I got one of the questions that I got was from a, a white person who who was saying something to the effect of they feel somewhat challenged or uncomfortable liking my work, hmm. and and they wanted to know, you know, like they liked the work but they weren't sure if they should like it or you know or not, and 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 then they asked the question, how do I feel about white people? owning and showing my work. And, you know, my response was basically that as is the nature of the art world, most of the people who collect my work are white people, but that doesn't diminish or change the work in any way. It doesn't undermine the work in any way. In fact, the reason that my work is focused on black identity and blackness is because that's my reality and that's my perspective. But ultimately what the work is about is humanity. I'm portraying black masculinity in its complex forms. I'm exposing the humanity in it. And anybody who's a human being should be able to appreciate what I'm talking about because there there are, are themes and ideas and experiences that that are common for all human beings. You know, blackness is just one aspect of that, but that it doesn't exclude anyone. And in fact, I think for a lot of reasons, you know, the the authenticity and the honesty and that actually opens it up to people of other racial experiences to have an appreciation for what it is that I do. And I ultimately think that this is one of the most important parts of being an artist. You know, I always say in the future, historians will tell what happened. 
an artist will tell how it felt. And it's like a responsibility that I assume that I that I hold as an artist to report the truth of my experience. And hopefully in telling that truth, it allows other people to acknowledge their truths. That ultimately becomes my main focus in, in the work. I think there will, of course, always be people who are unwilling to or unable to, and maybe perhaps more so unwilling to move past their own racial, whatever it may be, to see beyond the the the, the black skin in my work. But I, I haven't really had that experience where, you know, someone is just like, oh, no, that's, that's about black people. That has nothing to do with me, you know, kind of thing. I feel very fortunate and I knock on wood. Like, you know, I, I have really great engagement with people across spectrum about the themes in my work. You know, my work deals primarily with black male masculinity, but a lot of the people who are engaged with my work and talking about my work are women. Like I said, a lot of the people who collect the work are white, but that, again, it doesn't take away from the work because it is just about the human experience, just from my perspective of being a black male. When you look back at your career as an artist, what do you wish you would have known when you started? I can honestly say there there isn't anything that I, I would change about about my experience. Everything has been a, a great lesson and has helped shape, you know, the artist that I've become. If I were to go back and change something, I may miss something valuable and important. You know what I mean? That that has that has kind of helped make me who I am. If there's anything, I would say that maybe just having more patience with myself. You know, I, I tend to be hard on myself sometimes, you know, a, a, you know, in terms of like what I expect mm -hmm. from myself. But, you know, being patient with the process, I think, would would probably be the only thing. But even at that, I wouldn't change it because my impatience is what led me to do Bahamu Peku was the shit in the first place. Yeah. And lots of great, you know, lessons came out of that experience. Who are some other artists here in Atlanta that we need to know about? I mean, not just me, but, <laughs> but the audience that's listening. Who are some other artists we need to kind of, you know, like have on our radar? There are so many and you probably have them all on your radar already. So I feel like I might be repeating some things. But, you know, certainly Cosmo White comes to mind. Eric Mack comes to mind. Krista Clark, Paul Stephen Benjamin, Michael Jones, William Downs. What am I missing? Lily and Blades, Jiha Moon. Those are the ones that come right to, to mind off the top of my head. But there's so many. I mean, and again, you may know that Maya Bailey, Michael Reese, Sunit Nafan Savan, Fabian Williams, Occasional Superstar. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can keep going okay. if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> now, we'll, we'll make sure to, to put something together that kind of has all those artists in one place so people can check that out. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? What kind of work do you want to be doing? As a result of my PhD, you know, people keep asking me all the time if I'm planning to to teach, to go into the professoriate or anything like that. And from the time that I started my program, I was very adamant that that was not the direction that I was looking to go in. I'm actually much more interested in what's called public scholarship and thinking about ways of engaging communities and engaging individuals who are not necessarily plugged into the traditional institutional frames. You know, like I've always found it, you know, problematic that the art world exists in these white cubes and it doesn't necessarily engage the black community. Mm. And especially being an artist whose work and whose subject matter deals expressly with the black experience, oftentimes, again, my audience does not reflect reflect the work. And I've always tried to figure out ways to get that young dude, you know, in a small town in South Carolina, you know, in front of my paintings or in front of my work because I didn't have that growing up. And, you know, that would have been an amazing intervention on me psychologically, you know, developmentally had I had that experience. So always thinking about stuff like that. As a graduate student, I began to see very similar themes and patterns emerge, you know, especially doing my academic work and research around black identity, black sexuality, black ideologies in a classroom that was filled with people that looked 
anything other than me. And, you know, reading these texts that are amazing and have really amazing ideas, but knowing that the average person who looks like me will never pick up this book or never sit at this table and have this conversation. How do I engage those people with these themes and ideas? And so for me, my work becomes that bridge, that missing link. It is a way for me to engage publicly with the themes and ideas that are that make up my research, that make up my interests, and to be able to get in front of people who may not necessarily, you know, pick up that book or go to the museum and have these conversations with them. Like that, that's what's important to me. And so in the next five years, I hope, you know, you will find me in places where you've never seen art before, having conversations with people who've never had those conversations before. And, you know, making strides towards progress in this country that we've never had before. That's, that's, that's my hope. Well, that's, I think that definitely is a good place to kind of end things off here. So just to kind of wrap things up for everyone here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? Yeah, for sure. My website is fahamupekuart.com. That's F-A-H-A-M-U-P-E-C-O-U. A-R-T dot com. I'm also on Instagram at Fahamu Peku, F-A-H-A-M-U-P-E-C-O-U, as well as Facebook by the same name. My Twitter handle is F-P the shit, F-P-T-H-E-S-H-I-T. So yeah, that's me. All right. That sounds good. Well, Fahamu Peku, I want to thank you again so much for coming on the show. So much of what you mentioned here, I mean, I feel like I could probably go on for about 10 minutes off of the things that you have mentioned here. But I think that certainly the work that you're doing, of course, is super important. And I'm glad that it is being able to be seen a global scale. And even some of the things that you had, you know, just sort of mentioned about like longevity and relevancy. I think that's something very important for the revision path audience. A lot of our audience tends to be digital designers. And so the work that we do already has a certain level of, ephemerance in terms of how long it lasts. Like our last, you know, website design project may be up for a year or two and then it goes away. And so a lot of the work that we do already has this kind of built in sense of impermanence. Right. Which is interesting considering how much energy we tend to put into making it look good. But <laughs> not saying that it shouldn't look good, but just thinking about ways that we as designers and as artists for people that are listening can sort of sustain our work in a continued creative process practice and process to put it out there in the world, I think is something that is super important. And I'm glad that people have you to look up to for that. So thank you again so much for coming on the show. I appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I, I look forward to checking out all the episodes and continuing to be a part of this Atlanta art scene. Thoughts of love are in and that's it for this week. Big thanks to Fahamu Peku and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Fahamu and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, Glitch, Google Design, and MailChimp. With a community of over 2 billion people, the design team at Facebook works on a diverse range of problems. Everything Facebook designs is done at scale, so research, content strategy, data, and other factors are a huge part of how they work. Sound interesting? Then learn more about Facebook design and what they do at facebook.com forward slash design. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. Now, if you've seen Glitch, you might think, oh, it looks a little, you know, juvenile. It kind of looks like a toy. But let me tell you, it's not. It runs on the exact same infrastructure and engine that the best developers in the world use to run their apps. And it's all built around a friendly community of coders, designers, developers, artists, activists, educators, basically people just like you. So get started on making something awesome today at glitch.com. Google Design is a cooperative effort led by designers, writers, and developers at Google. They work across teams to publish original content, produce great events, and foster creative and educational partnerships that advance design and technology. For more information on news, design resources, and their design podcasts, check them out at design.google. MailChimp is the world's largest marketing automation platform. They support millions of customers from small e-commerce shops to big online retailers, and they support the creative community as well. MailChimp really gives you the marketing tools to be yourself on a bigger stage. 
Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, then please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute or two. It helps more people learn about the show here in the U.S. and internationally. It helps the show by bumping us up in the rankings for Design Podcasts. And I'll even read your review right here on the show, just like I did uh, for the two at the top of the show. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.